All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the August 2023 Virginia Tech Carilion Wilderness Medicine Journal Club session. Today's topic is search and rescue. Uh, we have two articles to discuss today, but first we are uh, joined by a special guest, Dr. Will Smith, who's going to be giving a presentation for us. Uh, Dr. Smith is an emergency medicine physician in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, he is also active with the Army National Guard. With He's a colonel. Uh, he's also the medical director of Grand Teton National Park and Teton Search and Rescue. Um, Dr. Smith, please take it away. And anything further that you're involved with, please share, because I'm sure you're uh, more involved far beyond that. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. So let's see if I can get my screen to share here. All right. How's that look? You guys all see in the background slides correctly? All right. So yeah, thanks everybody for joining. And uh, thanks, Justin, for kind of asking. So got asked to talk a little bit about search and rescue. And, and one of the concepts that I've used is called uh, crossing the, te the technical rescue interface. And I'm trying to see if I can go back. Doesn't like look like it wants to go back. So no conflicts or uh, <clears throat> final financial disclosures. And kind of with my background slides, this is what I like to call my office. So kind of do like was mentioned, do a co-medical direction for really all the EMS agencies for with one of my partners, Dr. AJ Wheeler out in Jackson or Teton County, Wyoming. So that includes both Jackson Hole Fire EMS, which is our primary 911 ambulance services with uh, two staff stations and, and lots of volunteers provide paramedic level service and really interface as well with the rescues and things that we get in the back country. Teton County Search and Rescue is our kind of search and rescue team. Also very active with that with both myself and Dr. Wheeler. We're going out doing short haul rescues, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, where we're hanging underneath the helicopters to get into real technical terrain. Also medical directors for Grand Teton National Park and interface very closely with those other agencies, as well as Bridger Teton National Forest. My real hat is working as an ER doc in Jackson Hole and St. John's Health. That's our local medical center. Um, I've got an uh, Army Reserve hat, like mentioned, so I'm Colonel and Branch Chief Director for the Army EMS Office and Army Disaster Medicine in the Army Office of Surgeon General. And with that, I've had some amazing opportunity to work with DARPA, so the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, so kind of really looking at some of these medicine in these far, far forward places and also looking at some of the search and rescue Work with ICAR, so International Commissioner on Alpine Rescue, the uh, uh, kind of leader of the International Drone Working Group, or the chair of that committee. And so if you're all going to be over in Italy in October, it'd be uh, great to see you in person. If you're uh, interested in ICAR, we're actually going to be hosting it in Jackson, Wyoming in 2025, October. So kind of mark it on the calendar and come up and see us there. It's one of the few times that ICAR is actually going to be held in the United States. And also do a lot of education, teaching, consulting. So medical director for a company, couple of companies like Wilderness Medical Associates, Rustic Pathways. I work with Constellus and Triple Canopy doing some medical oversight for some kind of operations with embassies over in uh, in Africa, as well as uh, working with a company called Vigilant. So that's usually what takes a lot of my time. Justin asked me a little bit just to, to briefly talk about how I got into search and rescue. And so it really started with growing up on a 22 acre cattle ranch in Wyoming. So really got used to the outdoors, being able to take care of myself in those settings. And then as time went along, continued my interest in pursuit of that passion, did ski patrol in undergrad, really took an EMT class my senior year of high school. And that's what got me interested in medicine. So kept working my way up the, the medicine flagpole uh, until I got to be emergency medicine and EMS physician in, in Jackson, Wyoming. And so I think really the big thing is like the Wilderness Medical Society often kind of uses the line of combine, combining your profession with your passion. So I think it's really getting your technical skills built up. So you're not a liability when you're out there in that wilderness setting, keeping your medical skills up. And so when you combine those, you can really do a lot of good. So I think that's kind of been the, the, the brief trajectory that I've been and been in Jackson now for about 20 years. So again, this is where we hail from. So Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, Jackson is actually the town, uh, just about uh, five, 10 miles south of Grand Teton National Park, <clears throat> about 60 miles south of Yellowstone. And so really a lot of wilderness terrain that we find ourselves in. 
And so like I mentioned at the beginning, we use this term and Seth Hawkins, whose name was mentioned a little bit ago, he actually is the kind of editor of the Wilderness EMS textbook. And part of that is a section called the technical rescue interface. And I really like how that terminology is laid out because it's really crossing over where you have typical EMS where the ambulance can just drive up to the street corner, load the patient up, but it's different in the wilderness, the austere, the, the sometimes combat or technical um, environments. And so you really have to do search and rescue operations and then cross them over that technical rescue interface to be able to do that normal continuation of care. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that textbook in the, the bottom right of the screen, the Wilderness EMS Medicine, um, chapter 24 in there really goes through a lot more of the details that we'll talk briefly about here. And then also wrote the Wilderness Trauma Care chapter with John Trentini um, <clears throat> talking about Wilderness Trauma Care. So a lot of these things that we're mentioning briefly, you can definitely find more in those uh, chapters in those textbooks. So when we start talking about wilderness medicine or search and rescue or kind of austere medicine, and again, a lot of those topics are uh, in terms are interchangeable, but really talking about starting with this, looking at the, the different realms. So in the bottom right, we're talking about remote and austere. So this is square top, one of the peaks in the Wind Rivers, kind of one of the more remote areas in Wyoming. And so really the wilderness is where you start getting away from the roads, the trailheads, and really have to start thinking about if you get a patient injured, um, how are you going to care for them? What are you going to use from your kind of front country principles to taking care of a patient in the back country? Then you start looking at different injury patterns, different mechanisms. So avalanche kind of continuing across the bottom. Um, how are a patient's going to be injured? So you got the trauma of the patient getting thrown down the hillside, going over cliffs. Um, some of the different avalanche train areas, whether or not you're talking about the U.S. or over in Europe, if you're high alpine, you're dealing with more, a lot of times the suffocation and burial versus in the U.S., you're dealing with more trauma going over trees and cliff bands. So there's some difference in variations when you start taking care of patients from these different type of specific environments. Looking at cave and confined space, I think we probably all watch the uh, Thai Cave Rescue and the, the kind of reenactments of that. And again, just an amazing, amazing kind of wilderness medicine search and rescue event where they got all the, the trapped soccer players out of the cave with pretty extensive wilderness medicine, um, being able to give them ketamine, kind of underwater periods, kind of high angle technical rescue periods to really combining a lot of these things across that technical rescue interface. Start playing at high altitude. So this is a, a picture on the top of Kilimanjaro in the bottom left there. And so if you look at my pulse ox, a pulse ox of 72%, heart rate of 118. And so if we look at that in most of our ambulance or our ERs, we're really thinking, all right, what's going on? You know, I need to get ready to intubate that patient. But no, it's just really understanding the physiology and the adaptation that the body's able to do. And those are actually resting and good vital signs. You start comparing that across the whole group and my SATs are 70 and you maybe have got somebody with high altitude pulmonary edema and their SATs are in the 40s. So how do you differentiate that? How do you treat that when you're in these environments? And again, we can go into lectures and in pretty much all these different areas way in depth, but just kind of giving some highlights and some overviews. Looking at dive and hyperbaric medicine, looking at swift water rescue there in the top left. Again, <clears throat> a lot of these variables that are out there, how to kind of manage yourself in the terrain and then kind of how to get your patients out, high angle and steep angle. Some of the rope systems, some of the principles are similar between high angle, swift water, cave, but then there's some variations that you definitely need to be aware of as well. And then you look at space, the next final frontier. I mean, we're kind of having people living in the International Space Station. Pretty soon we're going to have kind of space travel, trying to get to Mars, trying to get to Moon. Um, definitely thinking about that as the next search and rescue frontier. How are we going to take care of patients in those different environments? And a lot of things that we're already learning in some of these other wilderness realms definitely are applicable. Some of that can be transferred, but you want to be careful not just blindly transferring all that patient care because there's some variables that you need to make sure that you're thinking about in which each of those environments. So Search and rescue, definitely lots of tools. And so a lot of times starting with that bottom center is, is personal gear. So really being able to keep yourself safe, being able to transfer kind of yourself to this technical rescue interface. Then you start looking at team gear kind of in that top right. So looking, this is the, uh, the Jenny Lake Rescue Cache up in Grand Teton National Park. The more that you can have a team that's functioning and working together, the more effective you can be getting helicopters added into the mix, using drones kind of on the left picture there, really learning how to apply those in the search and rescue environment. 
And again, sometimes the one tool isn't the right tool for all settings, but sometimes that setting is a really good and then looking at the disruptive other technologies in medicine. So the ultrasounds, the point of care ultrasound. So being able to have kind of the butterfly or whatever kind of Lumify or whatever other um, <clears throat> specific uh, company making the specific product in your pocket and all the things that you can do with that in that wilderness environment. Another one of my hats that I've really enjoyed is in the military and then how that translates into the wilderness and search and rescue environment. So we really learn about like in TECC or tactical emergency casualty care, what we learn in Iraq and Afghanistan and these other military conflicts, that continuum of patient care. So what should we be doing for that patient at certain stages? So whether or not it's bullets being shot at you, whether or not it's being on the side of an avalanche slope, whether or not it's being chased by a bear, sometimes the most important thing is actually to mitigate the, the danger of that situation and scene. And so the military really has recognized that over these last years of conflict. If you download this deployed medicine app, so that top left corner, you can really upload or kind of download and see all the military training materials are all open source. There's great uh, clinical practice guidelines or CPGs on snake bites and a lot of these other wilderness medicine topics that are out there. They've got great videos that talk about the, the tourniquet usage and all these different things. So really a great resource. Military also now looking at these prolonged theaters. So in Iraq and Afghanistan, we could pretty much get any wounded service member from point of injury to uh, surgical capability generally within an hour, just because we had so many assets in the region but you start looking at Africa, you start looking at the Pacific theater campaigns, those you've sometimes got days. And so how do you take care of a patient? And that prolongedfieldcare.org is a great organization that's put a lot of thought into these situations and how to really adapt and improve survival as much as you can. And part of it's just realizing that unless you've got unlimited resources, there are gonna be sometimes some hard decisions to make in carrying patients in these different settings. If you go back and a member of the Wilderness Medical Society and also kind of the, the practice guidelines are out there, the bottom left, uh, it's been a few years ago, but in 2017, we had a, a special panel uh, down in Telluride, Colorado, and we put those all, all those uh, talks into this article or kind of special edition talking about transitioning the battlefield lesson learned to other austere environments. And so really, if you're looking at a lot of those principles, you can find those there. Along the bottom is just some other pictures of bringing kind of that technical rescue interface. So kind of that next one is working with the Homeland Security team doing tactical EMS in the Capitol just uh, shortly after the January 6th kind of event. And so uh, at the new, new inauguration, again, as we learned from like Hurricane Katrina, even some of these major metropolitan areas can change to a search and rescue wilderness austere type environment with some of these things going on. Next one is a predator attack response team. So that's a special team that we have on our search and rescue that is ready to do some defense posture and protection if we get into bear environments or potentially other large animals. So sometimes moose, sometimes other animals can be dangerous. And so carry kind of weapons, do similar training like you would in the military, but again, just making sure that we keep our members safe. Looking at the next picture over is just doing high angle technical rescue in the environment. Again, a lot of these principles carry over. And then the next one is medical director for uh, some of the U.S.-Mexico border units um, for some years. And so, again, looking at kind of all these things definitely blend together really well. Partnerships, <clears throat> just mentioned that briefly here. And again, kind of working with all those people that are next to you, having a common operating picture, kind of your patient care principles, kind of whether or not you're on the side of an avalanche slope, whether or not you're kind of uh, dealing with a, a tactical situation. Again, a lot of those patient care principles apply across that continuum. Talking about ideal to real care. So that's a, a principle that we use sometimes with uh, talking about technical and wilderness medicine from the Wilderness Medical Associates. So it's a term that David Johnson and Jeff Isaac, a couple of my mentors from that organization, but the ideal care is knowing exactly what you were going to do if you had everything with you. So you're in the ER, you're basically in all these different environments. And so that uh, is kind of a principle to use across all these. You know what you need to do, but really what should you be doing? And sometimes the most important thing is just to evacuate. 
looking at that ideal to real care. So thinking about the risk to benefits. And so spinal mobilization, spinal motion restriction, as we've kind of gone through the name changes in terminology, we used to think everybody needed to be backboarded. And there's actually been deaths because that's been done inappropriately for a potential injury, but the patient drowned because they were tied to a backboard and the boat flipped. And so again, just realizing kind of really taking an objective look of that risk to benefit in these different settings and SAR and, and the, the principles of wilderness medicine that we think we're doing right, but sometimes we could be doing wrong. Talking about the SAR principles is a, an acronym called LATE. And so when you're really taking care of patients across this technical rescue interface, Locate is that first thing. So with a lot of 911, cell phones, technologies, personal locating, beacons, inreaches, spots, it's been a lot easier to sometimes find people when they're in danger and need. But there's also been times that these have been inappropriately used or people just don't understand the technology. In Colorado, there was a little while where somebody was using their, they thought they had an avalanche transceiver, but they actually had a remote uh, personal locating B or spot device. So every time they went out, they thought they were turning it on and they were pressing the emergency button SOS. So by the time the search and rescue teams got to the location, they've done their activity and turned it off and basically went back to the car and couldn't find them. And so finally, after a couple of weekends of this person thinking they were doing everything right, they actually educated them a little bit and said, no, you're actually using it wrong. And it's not an avalanche transceiver. It was a, an emergency beacon that was activating the SAR team every time they went out. So once you've located your patient, then the next thing is access. And so again, this uh, picture here is a plane crash in the wind rivers. And so again, sometimes getting to some vehicle is very difficult. So thinking about caves, thinking about remote areas, thinking about space, again, kind of how are you gonna access that patient? What technology? Helicopters are really good until the helicopters can't fly or you have some sort of emergency that a helicopter can't be your tool. So always planning that plan B and plan C if your helicopter or your access plan isn't able to get you to where you can access that patient and take care of them. And then the bottom two are treat and extricate. And like I mentioned before, depending on some of the locations, depending on some of the dangers of these scenes, an avalanche path, maybe a bear still in the area, bullets still flying. If you're talking about a combat or tactical situation, sometimes the most important thing is actually to extricate that patient out before you start doing patient care. And so just again, when you're, and especially as advanced medical providers, we, we know everything we think we know about medicine, but then sometimes in that environment, we have to realize that that has a role of sometimes that decision on when you should provide that care. So this is a um, search and rescue call that we had in the Tetons back in March of 2017. Um, kind of, Justin, if you give me a thumbs up if the audio is coming through, right? Let's see. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. There's supposed to be some background 911 audio, but doesn't look like that's coming. Oh, no, I can't hear that. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me stop sharing for just a second. And let me see if I click these two buttons here, if that kind of gets us to where we need to be. Uh, all right, so it doesn't seem like that's going to uh, um, play, but basically the 911 call comes in. It's a 61-year-old male having a heart attack, and we've seen a few cases of this where somebody has their STEMI or their ST elevation in my, and they basically just you lose their ability for forward motion. So they're just having so much chest pain, so much shortness of breath, and so much weakness um, that their heart just isn't able to kind of continue giving them that strength to actually move forward. And that's what happened with this guy. They called 911, and so we were able to... All right, and you guys have a medical emergency going on? What's, what's going on? Yes, we do. Um, my husband's having chest pains. I don't know if he's having a heart attack. He can't, he can't breathe. He's got really bad pains. How old is he? Yes. 61. 61? All right. It's about the coordinates. We have the coordinates. Did you get them? We, I do have your coordinates. Um, he has them. He got them off. It really just goes through a lot of the same questions that you would on a regular 911 call, but some of those, again, specific things in the backcountry, exact location, access points. A lot of times when you are talking to people that are out there, they hopefully have some idea on the best way to get themselves in or out or kind of what the local terrain is like. And so really applying these search and rescue principles, the locate, the access, the treat, and the extricate kind of in all these environments, that helps you get that plan in place and what you're going to do. As we are going in, 
getting short hauled in, the patient went into cardiac arrest. And so the, the family members and friends, they had never taken any formal CPR training, but they did see those public service announcements for cardiac arrest, call 911 and push hard and fast in the center of the chest. And that's what they started doing. So as we started getting short hauled in, we found out the patient yeah, sure. was in uh, a cardiac arrest. And again, just thinking about what a patient in this remote environment, what you're gonna be able to do from the ALS standpoint, Again, it's very simple, going to be getting that AED on, and this was what the AED screen showed um, after we interpreted the rhythm, but we put the AED on and we're able to do a shock, thinking about other tools and adjuncts. So in cardiac arrest, there's been studies that say sometimes if you've got good unlimited resources, then you can do CPR as good ma manually as well as you can do these mechanical. But like if you're doing short haul or other technical rescue or like our ski patrol, using some of these mechanical CPR devices has definitely been helpful. Because we know in a lot of these cardiac arrest cases, up to half or more will go into cardiac arrest again. So being able to have compressions to be done as you're trying to get that patient out of that technical rescue interface. So in this case, <clears throat> we gave the patient a shock and within 10 minutes was alert and awake and talking with us. So again, that perfect chain of survival that we got the AED there in time, they activated 911. We were able to get basically what it would have taken three hours by ground with a helicopter. We were able to get there within a few minutes when just at that right time when he arrested. Got the patient out. And this is where, again, crossing that technical rescue interface. So we're changing now from that back country to the front country protocols. And so doing all those things that we do for STEMI's IVO2 monitor, 12 lead aspirin, some amiodarone. We knew he's already had a V-fib arrest or a shockable arrest and holding nitroglycerin um, just because of a concern about some potential hypotension if there was an inferior MI component. So anterior lateral STEMI is what he was showing. So our hospital doesn't have a cath lab. So we needed to get him to where he could get definitive cardiac care and then extracting the rest of the, the party, this is what the, the short haul extraction of the party was. And so short haul, just briefly, is a location where the helicopter is not able to land and we don't have a hoist. So basically, this is a fixed rope underneath the helicopter, generally about 150 feet, can be longer in some situations. The pilot comes in, sometimes deposits people, gear on scene, and then comes in to extract the patients. And so coordination of hand signals. And this is what it looked like extracting the wife of that patient who wasn't in a physical or mental capacity to really ski out after that cardiac arrest of her husband. And this is what the short all comes in like. Again, just amazing coordination from the pilot <clears throat> to bring the hook onto the end of the line and then clip into a single point and then be able to extract out. And so a combination of both radio signals as well as kind of hand signals to be able to kind of know that hookup. And again, just a, a great extraction tool that we use in the, in the wilderness settings and ketons, as well as a lot of people use in other places. Bigger aircrafts a lot of times have hoist, um, but the, the helicopters and the size we use, the, the short haul technique here has definitely been very beneficial. And again, that's really what saved this guy's life is to be able to get myself and one of the other rangers into that scene just at the right time. Otherwise it would take two or three hours. Hooking up, <clears throat> seeing your connection point, double checking. And extracting them from the scene. So here's a, a training video that I did um, kind of last year, um, put this together. And this really shows kind of that whole procedure and kind of process of doing a short haul kind of rescue mission from start till getting inserted in the extraction. Our search and rescue hanger here. We have a screen of three to four people in the pilot. I just ran away from home. Now I'm going to Disneyland. I just 
So yeah, somebody put in the text kind of looks like a fun ride where we sign up. Circle search and rescue team that has a short haul program. So again, very technical, lots of proficiency, lots of training, but the amount of places that you can get into and the amount of time you can save and patience to get extracted from and out of, uh, it's really a very, very useful tool. And so a lot of the times with helicopters, you talk about the risk of using a helicopter, but you also have to balance that the risk of sending a 30 or 50 person search and rescue team into a remote location in cold environments with other avalanche paths and things. So a lot of times, even though the helicopter has initial risks itself, the overall risk of the mission can be less um, when you have a helicopter for people, rescues done in an hour compared to like potentially even days or overnight um, for other things. So those are all the things we take into account where we're looking whether or not we would use a helicopter on one of those missions. So looking at the timeline, back to that cardiac arrest case. <clears throat> so from that call to the rescuers on scene, an hour and 33 minutes. And so again, not your typical kind of front country time metric, but in a backcountry setting that would have taken you three plus hours, uh, not bad with the helicopters being able to work. Uh, on scene was a 33 minute scene time, 10 minutes of that was CPR. 
Um, we went and had to call in some additional resources and let her to get the patient packaged after we went into cardiac arrest. And once we got the patient out, they were with the ambulance in 17 minutes, a 32 minute flight to Eastern Idaho Regional Medical Center in Idaho Falls. And that's where our closest cath lab is. And so from the call to the balloon up time was three hours and 30 minutes. And didn't quite make the, the 90 minute mark, but again, for a wilderness search and rescue, cardiac arrest case, not bad times with a neurologically intact survival. When you are working in the wilderness environment, um, search and rescue is really deconflicting a lot of the resources. So this is both kind of our search and rescue helicopter and the air ambulance helicopter, both making sure that they're not going to, uh, you want to make sure you deconflict so there's not a crash kind of in those environments. So as you're dealing with one of these bigger search and rescue events, that it gets to be more and more complexity. So making sure you, that you're really planning for that, kind of getting that communication is key to uh, make sure you're having that deconfliction occur. So the patient in flight continued to have some uh, ectopy. And then once he actually got into the cath lab, had another cardiac arrest, but they were able to shock him in the cath lab and, and get him back right away. If you look at his angiography, he had a, a large left anterior descending or LAD lesion. The picture in the left is the, the before the balloon was up. And then the picture on the right is once the balloons got up, opened up the blockage and then went in and put that stent in. So you can see kind of uh, what that patient really needed to get to a definitive cardiac care. So a lot of the things that we do in the wilderness in the search and rescue environment are really off of the front country kind of traditional EMS and medicine uh, kind of metrics. So the chain of survival, again, the more that you can minimize those, the more that you can build on each other, looking at pit crew CPR, looking at kind of the priorities when somebody gets ROSC, um, again, all those get extrapolated to that backcountry and really cross over that technical rescue interface. So this is a uh, fine line podcast that our search and rescue team does, our backcountry zero, which is our preventative search and rescue arm. Uh, but this is uh, Mike, the guy in the center was the guy that uh, was the cardiac arrest patient. <laughs> and actually, a lot of these episodes are really neat to get that patient perspective on that search and rescue. And so this is a little bit of it. I really didn't have any pain when I died. And then I just had this really weird moment of like, what's going on? And I can see this like rapid kind of up and down movement and my brain won't wrap itself around the fact that I'm witnessing CPR in progress and uh, that's going to change the tone of this whole rescue. I'm Rebecca Huntington. So yeah, those fine line podcasts are really neat to get that additional perspective of the patient. There's great ones on psychological first aid, and a lot of these other rescues that we've done. So medical oversight. So again, kind of if you are going to be doing medical direction for search and rescue teams, uh, again, kind of the, the basic principles out there, the direct medical oversight. And that's what I really find fun is getting actually out there on scene and providing patient care, assisting kind of medics, nurses, other ALS, and even BLS providers on our team, um, being able to do online medical control, being able to kind of help guide some of that resuscitation, and then looking at the indirect part of it as well. So really kind of for the, the providers that are out there taking care of these patients, making sure they've got good protocols, good documentation, because that really shares a lot of the QA and QI, because there's not a whole lot of cardiac arrest survivals that are out there in the, the wellness medicine kind of field. So when these cases happen, kind of learn from them, both the good as well as the ways that you can improve if things didn't go right, and then really helping with that training so another textbook um, <clears throat> reference here. So Wilderness EMS Medical Oversight in the NAEMSP or National Association of EMS Physicians um, with Seth Hawkins and Michael Millen. We actually wrote a chapter that focuses on wilderness EMS and we actually do classes based on wilderness EMS medical direction. So um, we're not sure exactly when the next class is gonna be, but keep on the, uh, we've got a website out there, um, but really looking at helping guide that medical decision-making when you're taking care of these patients in that technical rescue interface. Another call here that talks a little bit with a slightly different outcome, unfortunately, but uh, again, kind of goes through some of these principles as well. 2226 Jackson. 2226, can you start rolling South Highway 89? We just had a car go off the road and possibly into the river south of the bridge. I'm rolling. Captain. 
So driver had a cardiac arrest, kind of went off the road through the guardrail. And so a lot of us have taken care of patients from cardiac arrest. A lot of us have taken care of patients from car accidents. But when you start adding the complexity of a swift water rescue into that, again, the dangers of just hopping into the river without uh, uh, the right PPE, with right uh, dry suits, without uh, uh, personal flotation devices or PFDs, you can definitely end up having more kind of potentially even rescuer fatalities or bystander fatalities. So really kind of training as you're looking for taking care of patients in these settings. So again, really apply all those same principles we talked about before. So locate, we already know where the patient's at. Access, how are you gonna get people out there? So you're getting people in the right PPE. Then in the middle of the river, are you gonna be doing kind of full ACLS resuscitation pit crew CPR on the, the, the hood of a car that potentially is unstable in the middle of the river? Probably not. So this is another example of when you probably are gonna be extricating that patient very quickly versus kind of treating them on scene. And also getting kind of medical control on scene or very close in the decision loop process. And so that's me there in the center of the picture, actually kind of looking at the patient. He had been underwater for over an hour um, in cardiac arrest, elderly gentleman. So this is where you would sometimes make that decision. And this is what we did is we pronounced him dead at that point. And now you're changing it from a rescue to a recovery. And so you can slow down the operation tempo, stabilize the scene more, and then just make sure that you've got kind of body recovery. So patient in the middle of the river, you need to make sure that they've got a PFD on, especially if they're deceased. But that's one of the worst things. You never want to lose a body or a patient kind of once you've uh, kind of uh, got to their location and are getting ready to extricate them. So that's our <clears throat> jet boat that we had. And then we got them off the side of the river and then went to and did the, the typical pronouncement. So we got a 12 lead or not 12 lead, just a three lead that made sure that it was a systole and two leads. Uh, if you have your point of care ultrasound, you can confirm no cardiac activity. And again, all those things, the chance of survival is virtually zero. Uh, and so just changing that to a, to a rescue and pronouncement. Cold water submersion, all those different things, again, in wilderness medicine principles, you have to kind of take into account. Um, but uh, again, uh, not really a hypothermic kind of death in this case. So looking at patient care in wilderness emergency medicine, so looking at kind of some of these protocols across the, the continuum, so whether or not it's military, austere, wilderness, again, a lot of similar principles across those, kind of when are the chances of survival worth the risk of the rescue? And again, sometimes that can be a really tough decision. So looking at that Thai cave rescue, kind of they risked a lot, but they saved a lot. And so again, that's kind of one of the big mantras that we sometimes use in this work. And each situation has multiple variables. So again, especially doing medical oversight, especially doing some of the medical decision-making, making sure that you're just not blindly applying principles from one environment to another, while there still may be some similarities, making sure that you're recognizing what those differences are as well. So some references out there, again, like I mentioned, the prolongedfieldcare.org, the deployed medicine, and you can actually download that app. The Wilderness Medical Society has a lot of practice care guidelines. We're just getting ready to do some uh, revisions of those here pretty soon. And then looking at the, the Committee for Tactical Emergency Casualty Care. And that's a, another good uh, group that's out there as well. So with that, I think the opportunity for uh, talking to you guys today, and I can probably take a couple of questions in the chat if that's uh, okay. And then we can go on. It sounds like there's gonna be a little bit more of uh, things to follow. And I'll put my contact information back there in a second if I can go to the back. Yeah, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, as far as questions go, yeah, we can definitely do it in the chat throughout. Um, as far as a few questions right now, does have any anybody have any questions as far as like how to be involved in search and rescue, medical direction, wilderness, EMS, uh, things like that? I guess we can do it in the chat then. <laughs> Any other questions until we move on to some articles? Uh, I guess I could, I had a question. Um, yeah. So I'm, a, I'm in medical school. How much training and how is like a good way to get involved in search and rescue stuff? Um, obviously some of this requires some pretty technical experience uh, and obviously a little bit of medical experience too. So 
what's kind of like the earliest point that you can start getting involved in this kind of stuff? Uh, I think it depends on your location and what other teams are there. Um, for like me, I joined a local ski patrol. So I just started at the very basic. So I just went in as everybody else would that doesn't have any other background, not in medical school or kind of even if you are in medical school um, and, and just start working kind of side by side by the people who are actually doing it, get those basic skill sets. And then as you kind of build your more medical education through finishing med school and residency and potentially even getting board certified in EMS and really becoming a subspecialty expert, um, it really depends on that local environment and kind of deciding what teams are there and reaching out. And usually most of the teams are pretty receptive once you get in. Um, I think the big thing is just to be careful, not beating your chest, going in the door, saying I'm kind of the best medical doctor from X, Y, Z, and I'm going to hear and save every patient that you have. And um, you really have to be very humble and kind of just work your way in, kind of be one of the grunts, be kind of one of the, the, the just as happy to carry the heavy bags up the hill as you are to be doing the advanced patient care. So that's kind of my advice and kind of finding what uh, locations, what uh, teams are at your location. Looks like there's another question that popped up. Um, what level do you train the SAR staff and people, people helping out on the rescues? <clears throat> so for our search and rescue team, we try and make wilderness first responder, the, the baseline medical care level um, for there. Um, there's other teams that are out there that have some more specialty medical that's more advanced life support, um, but it really varies. But most of the time it's at that BLS level. And in a lot of these kind of search and rescue cases, you really are just focusing on that basic life support until you can get them extricated and then you can do that more advanced care. And so you may be not necessarily in that most technical part of the rescue, but you can be waiting at the trailhead or you could be waiting at that next extrication point to where you can do that ALS skill. How did you get involved with the National Park Service? So got involved with the Grand Teton National Park by when I moved to Jackson, uh, became a full-time ER kind of doc there. Um, I was a paramedic before I went to med school, so really had that background and experience, and then really just started working with the, the Park Service locally, and then have done quite a bit on the national level as well. So it's really <clears throat> kind of reaching out there. It's really networking. It's uh, um, kind of finding what, uh, what teams and things you have in your location, but sometimes there's always other networking that's out there. So doing kind of wilderness medicine fellowships, going to national level conferences, um, continuing to network with people out there. And you just never quite know kind of where that next phone call is going to end you. And it may not be next week. It may not be next year, maybe a decade. You just never know. Um, people just kind of keep recirculating around. And if you're really interested in it, just kind of keep working, kind of staying humble and build your skill set and kind of being close to potentially where these things are going on. And usually you can get your foot in the door. quick question. It's kind of going to go along with the article that I'm going to talk about, but is the Grand Teton area that you're working with, is that the, when there is search and rescue operations are going on, is it just you guys as the park service responding or is it like a mutual thing with uh, the Jackson area EMS? Like who goes to these calls? Yeah. So again, it's sometimes each case is a little bit variable. So when you really kind of start looking at search and rescue, you start looking at what they call the area having jurisdiction. So where is the physical call? Is it inside Grand Teton National Park boundaries? Is it in Teton County? Um, is it in a surrounding county? Is it in a surrounding state? And so you start looking at kind of which team or jurisdiction has the responsibility for doing that rescue. So if it's in Grand Teton National Park and they've been having a lot this summer, they've got a full-time Jenny Lake staff. That's the 20 to 30 rescue rangers, both full-time and part-time. They've got usually their own helicopter resource. <clears throat> so they're pretty self-sufficient and they're a paid team. So like myself and kind of Dr. Wheeler, we generally don't get up there except for one of the bigger rescues unless we already happen to be up there. And so they're able to manage most of those things. Every once in a while, we'll get a phone call, help kind of do some medical decision-making remotely. But in the wintertime, Grand Teton only has a handful of full-time rangers. So a lot of times our search and rescue team from the county will augment the team up in the park. And so it just varies sometimes in Teton County where our local county search and rescue team, it's mostly volunteers that AJ and I are also involved with. 
Sometimes the park service will help augment our team because they've got people that have got the helicopter qualifications. We may not have enough of those from our volunteer team because people are just out of position. So it really is a combined effort with multiple different kind of potential people going on each one of those rescues, if that makes sense. Any other questions uh, for Dr. Smith before we have uh, Jessica present her article, which, as she said, uh, does touch on this and discusses National Park Service search and rescue operations. Any other questions? Chat will still be available. Okay. Thanks again, Dr. Smith. And if you wanted to uh, jump in at any point because this article will probably touch on things that you do quite often. Um, Jessica, take it away. You should have share screen. All righty. Let's see. Can you see it? Maybe not. Yep, it's coming across now. Cool, great. All right, so here we go. All right, is it just the the preview of the front slide there? Great, Looks cool. Good. All righty, so um, I'm going to be discussing an article and I'm gonna preface this by saying there's a couple of things that people can interact with if they'd like. If not, we'll just keep moving along. But uh, there was an article released called The Dead Men Walking Search and Rescue in U.S. National Parks, and it was written by Dr. Hedgy, I think is how he pronounced it, and Mr. Michael Amundsen. Uh, just like he mentioned, my name is Jessica Burnt. I'm a fourth-year med student from the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, and I'm pleased to have the chance to talk with you guys. So our action plan I have a couple of jokes in there, is we're going to talk about the credentialing, objectives, uh, the study design, the methods they use, the results that they produced, discuss it a little bit, do a little hot wash, and then I'll have the resources at the end. All right, so Dr. Hedgy uh, and Mr. Amundsen. I did find anything on Mr. Abinson, so um, if anyone's good at stalking people, maybe they can find more on him. But Dr. Hedgy uh, is well known. I have a great little picture in the corner there. He seems like a cool dude. Um, but they both came from the University of North Dakota, Grand Falls, um, North Dakota. They were a part of the Recreation Tourism Studies program when they wrote this. And Dr. Hedgy was in the Great Plains Injury Prevention Research Initiative. He gave his address, email, so if anyone has questions, they can contact him. Uh, he's currently a professor at Bowling Green, and I little did my own stalking, and he was working with the National Park Service in their public risk management specialist, as a specialist there, and also a tort claims officer and also an erup eruption duty ranger in Hawaii, which sounded super cool. Um, and he has lots of other publications as well. So does anyone know where this is? Kind of in honor of Dr. Hedgy. Any guesses? All right. So this is the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Uh, it's in North Dakota. And so that's where he hailed from. So the objective of the paper was to identify the trends and patterns associated with search and rescue within the National Park Service from 1992 to 2007. Anyone know where this is? Cool. That looks like Sequoia, but I guess it could be Yosemite if you're looking at the bottom yeah. right. So it's Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park, which looked amazing. So you're right. All right, so their study design, it's a retrospective review of the U.S. National Park Service, like I said, from 1992 to 2007. They looked at their reports, so annually they release their reports on all the search and rescues that they do, and they then specifically looked at the 2005 uh, statistics, and there were a bunch of variables that they looked at across the board um, from all of these reports, and it seemed like they tried to narrow it down to 
uh, the variables that most common were reported. There were a lot of variables that some reports included and some didn't. And so they tried to narrow them down. They took all the data and they coded and entered it using the SPSS version 15. I don't know what that means, but other people might. So, and that's the version they used. Fun fact, the picture in this is from the wilderness conference that was held up at WVU where they did a high angle rescue rig. And so that was pretty cool. Anyone was there? So these were their results. So from 1992 to 2007, there were 78,488 individuals involved in 65,439 search and rescue incidents. So that translates to about 4,000 search and rescues per year within the National Park Service. This uh, ended with about 2,600 fatalities, 24,000 um, illnesses or injuries, uh, 51,000 non-illness or injuries, and 13,000 saves. And so saves is uh, when there's a call that was done, operation that was done, and they were rescued. And if they hadn't gotten there, ooh, they hadn't gotten there, then it would have been a higher risk for fatality. I don't know why I don't. There we go. We're back. Risk of fatality if they hadn't gotten there. So, and the big number was fifty-eight uh, million dollars uh, in total SAR costs across those multiple years. So that. It was roughly an annual $3.7 million spent in search and rescues across the National Park um, system. And this averaged about 11.2 search and rescue incidents each day across the year um, and an average of $895 per operation. Um, breaking down that cost, about 50% of it is used on personnel and then 50% is used on the aircraft costs. And I thought this was interesting, 33% of the aircraft costs were for military aircraft. So I don't know if Dr. Smith can touch on that, but apparently the funds are allocated from the National Park Service to the military aircraft versus their own. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly on that, but definitely there yeah. is a lot of aircraft cost and if the study was caught up, I think probably that's continued to grow <clears throat> um, just with the, the kind of feasibility of helicopters getting into the time sensitivity injuries. Um, but as far as exactly what that is, um, usually if it's a military aircraft, it's government, but sometimes there is kind of cross government organization payment. So um, not exactly sure. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I kind of gave away the answer to this top one, but did anyone catch it and want to share it? <laughs> This top picture here. Oh. All right, it's like Mead. Oh, it keeps doing that. Oh. All right, and so like I said, they looked from 1997 to 2007, and then they looked specifically at 2005 uh, National Park Service results. And so hiking was the most common cause of search and rescue calls. And it was mostly from that 15 to 4,500 uh, meter mark. So anything above that, there were only like 16 calls um, across the, the country, if it was any higher. But then below that's boating. Um, and then search and rescue durations. There weren't a many of the reports that included it, but 94% of them were found within 24 hours and then 2.5% were never found. So, um, it's not great, but yeah. Um, and then hiking, suicides, and swimming, so boating at the end, uh, were the most common activities resulting in fatalities, unfortunately. Does anyone recognize the bottom picture? What is that? Denali. Yeah. Which, yeah. All right, so what national park had the largest number of search and rescue operations in 2005? Anyone want to guess what it was? Any guess or anything? Yosemite. Yosemite, no, close, but it was the Grand Canyon. Uh, and, yep, yep. So they had 307 um, search and rescue operations 
but not too far behind was Gateway and then Yosemite, like you mentioned. Um, and so we're going to kind of keep those in mind, the rest of it. So what national park had the highest search and rescue costs in 2005? My guess is this one is going to be Yosemite, and that's Angel Falls there. Uh, and so Yosemite came way on top with 1.2 million. And then far below was that Sequoia and Kings Canyon that we saw a picture of earlier. Um, something I think is interesting is the Grand Canyon, or sorry, the Great Smoky Mountains is up here on the cost here. It does make the top 10, but it doesn't make the top 10 in the most search and rescue um, operations in the year. So um, I thought that was interesting. They have uh, a fewer search and rescues, but they're still on the, the cost here. Another interesting fact was the Wrangell, I might pronounce that right, Wrangell St. Elias National Park Preserve uh, came up top with the highest average search and rescue cost with 29,000 and Denali uh, second for $18,000 uh, per search and rescue. It kind of makes sense based off of where they are and the resources they'd have to use. Um, and then Dr. Smith, you can correct me on this, but it mentioned in the article that the National Park Service is not required to respond to calls. They are allowed to use their discretionary ability to uh, look at their agency and what they can provide, how and when, um, and if they want to use their services to respond to these calls. Most of the times they do, and they have the resources for it, but they're not required to. In that same vein, they do not require any of their victims or their patients to pay them. Um, it is a free service, and if it's, now this was published, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, but if it was less than $500, the park service would pay it out of their own park accounts. And if it was over 500, it would come from the national SAR account. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, right. I mean, it's just kind of that, a lot of the SAR philosophy of just going out and helping people. Um, the park service generally kind of responds uh, unless it's just unsafe to do so. So like I know Denali's had some like plane crashes on glaciers that have had some delayed response. So um, just to automatically assume that anytime you call kind of for 911, I mean, and here in the US, I think we got a little spoiled thinking that no matter what we do, somebody's coming to save us. But other places of the world, they definitely know that that's not the option. And the self rescue may be the only option that you have, especially in the Him Himalayas and things. But now helicopters are getting to be almost more ubiquitous over there. But generally, the search and rescue tries to kind of protect the property, protect the life, protect the wildlife. And so they generally do what they can. But uh, again, I think that's kind of that bottom line and kind of the federal code to kind of give them the ability to not a mandated rescue. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, so some things that they discussed at the end, looking at the results, um, like I mentioned, 11.2 SAR operations per day on averaging eight, $895. And I think they just did some statistics to kind of make some average numbers there. But um, the most common contributing circumstance were insufficient information or error in judgment that were made. Uh, first and the second fatigue, physical condition, and then insufficient equipment. Uh, the most common activities were hiking. They just they did not discriminate between day or overnight. And our young men uh, were most Report to individuals for those search and rescues and Saturdays, you know, the best day to go out. And suicides accounted for only 1% of all the search and rescue incidents, but were 12% of all deaths, um, which makes sense. And then mountaineering and hiking, it's growing faster each day, which is great, um, but it also leads to more instances of people needing help and getting injured. So that was Wrangell St. Elias. So it was one of those super expensive search and rescue operations, um, but it's beautiful. All right, so does this mean that our 20-something-year-old men on Saturdays need to go through a PowerPoint presentation to make sure they're equipped well to go hiking? No, maybe, maybe a little bit, um, but no, it's meant for 
this research paper was meant to provide us with direction for future resource allocation and prevention measures. Um, and so we know where the places are expensive and the places that aren't as expensive. I wish that they had looked more into the number of visitations that these parks got. Like I mentioned, the Smoky Mountains has more than double the amount of visitors, um, but a lower amount of search and rescue operations. So why is that? Um, are they doing something different than another park? Is that something that we can learn from? Is that something that can be included in future studies? Uh, and looking more individually uh, in the reports, so getting more information from each of those search and rescue uh, reports that are published, you know, what specifically was the equipment failure? Um, did they not have a map? Was the weather this or that? You know, just getting more information, I think, would really help us plan uh, accordingly. And then kind of like my question, my question earlier was, you know, this was just from the park, the National Park Service, but there are local communities um, and different EMS services that support a lot of these operations. So it might be so many millions of dollars, but it's way more when you start to include all the other organizations that are helping. Um, something to me I think is interesting is how wildfires play into all these national park services. I mean, those are huge amounts of uh, resources. Um, how many search and rescue operations are involved in these scenarios? That's more of a personal interest of mine. Um, and then the conflict of interest, I mean, the writer of this used to work in the office, um, the tort office. And so, you know, there's a risk of I don't know, inflation of the numbers, maybe to get um, more attention uh, or to get better funding uh, for the published study. So I think it's something he should have maybe disclosed more in the paper. So, and then that's me. That was at the New River Gorge last week. So that was cool. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, um, I'd be glad to take them. Um, and Hi, yeah, this is uh, Fred Bossert. Um, so well, I live in Tennessee and I go to the Smokies a lot. So I, I, you know, thinking about that, one thing is the Smokies are so drivable. So it is, uh, I'm 99% I'm sure it's the most visited national park in the country by like a ton. But it's so drivable that I, my guess is that so many people can go through it and count as visitors and pop off and do some of the trails. Now they definitely have some more technical stuff I mean, relatively, but I guess my guess would be that, but would be that would be a big part of it. And then the other thing I was going to comment on, uh, great, great job by the way. Um, but the other thing I was going to comment on was that um, I can't remember what WMS thing I was involved in where this this topic came up of charging people for it. I don't know if it was book club, if it was the podcast. I, I so forgive me, or if it was the summer conference. Everybody's like, oh yeah, it was summer. I don't know, but. Whatever it was, I remember this, this thing came up and one of the big issues was if you charge for it, it like puts you into a new realm of liability of potentially getting sued um, if you don't have, if it's not done perfectly or if it's not done, however, it just, it opens it up if, versus if you don't charge for it, then it is more of the, it's not quite good Samaritan per se, but but it, but it's, it falls, falls more into that area. So I know that was like one of the, the things that people had debated and talked about because some local counties had talked about charging people for some of these things uh like in mount rainier and, and some of these areas and they ultimately i think decided not to because of the liability anyways just for what it's worth no thanks for sharing and they mentioned that in the article and they also referenced you know if people ex think they're gonna pay for it they might not call they not, might not ask for help if they're gonna have to pay for it too so they mentioned that Any other questions or comments? If you actually look at like the pamphlets or if you enter a national park, they always hand out the, like the, it looks like a newspaper. It's sort of like news bulletins and your map and the entry park um, notifications, small text at the bottom always says like some disclaimer about search and rescue operations and like basically saying like, uh, don't expect to be rescued. I, I don't know the exact terminology. I think it's probably different in each park, but they definitely disclaim it. Small text, but it's there. Yeah, this is well. So yeah, great presentation and summary. 
Yeah, so there's a lot of kind of concepts around charging for search and rescue, both here in the US as well as like Europe and other places around the world. I know I think Denali has some of the climbing fees that does go into a little bit of a search and rescue fund. There are some of the kind of other like hunting licenses and fishing licenses like in Wyoming um, goes to a search and rescue fund to kind of help. And that's more on the state level. Uh, most of the state jurisdictions for search and rescue falls to the county sheriff. And so again, that interaction of kind of local versus kind of federal assets, uh, military can sometimes pl play a role as well as mentioned in the, the comments. Um, I, I think, uh, again, a lot of it kind of is really trying to do that preventative search and rescue and kind of get people the education to hopefully make wise decisions out there. But like I've seen and kind of why I keep doing search and rescue because it could be me that next time. I mean, Mother Nature always gets to say that rock boulder has been sitting there for 25,000 years and decides to fall today on you or you kind of just <clears throat> have a, a, a technical slip. And kind of, again, that's part of the fun and adventure being out there. But again, something can, can always potentially happen. So uh, great job. All right. Any other questions about this article itself? I know it was a little bit outdated, 2009, but it I like the content it included. Um, it's nice to talk about the cutting edge stuff, but sometimes if it just sits right, <laughs> then, I, then I go for it. And Christine, actually, one of our fellows actually chose this article. Um, any thoughts? Were you able to hear Christine or do you have good contention right now? Um, any thoughts? Sounds yeah, like, no. sorry, <laughs> like a significant delay here. Can you hear me? Okay, so I, I did have a few points uh, just that I thought might be good discussion points. And one of them was the in the methods, the way that they um, separated of the 65,000 SAR incidents, how they separated it into fatalities, ill or injured. And then say let me have the delay catch up here. Well, one of the poignant things about it was one out of five of those people requesting SAR assistance would have been a fatality. Um, so I believe that's of the 13,000 saves that they listed of the 65 total. But I was just wondering, in the other category that they had of 24,000 that were ill or injured, what would happen if they weren't responded to in an appropriate amount of time, if they would have turned into a fatality? So I think that one out of five um, people that would have been a fatality, it could actually be an even higher number um, if you include some of those that are ill or injured, if they wouldn't have had any help at all. So the methods don't really describe that so well um, of like the time points that they use or the, the type of injuries that they had. So if you added more time onto those people, um, would they have become a fatality? So. Yeah, they didn't particularly go into like how they came to their conclusions and things like that. I think they could have done a better job explaining, um, yeah, how they, they came to the certain statements they discussed. Yes. My other thought about it was um, Yosemite had the highest number of total SAR operations and what sort of factors do you guys think that may have led to this? Of Yosemite in particular, why is it the most? Why is it the most? Did everybody hear her? I think what she was saying was why was Yosemite National Park uh, the park that had the highest highest associated. I think it would probably be somewhat similar to Grand Canyon in that there is a lot of high angle, there is a lot of helicopter use. Any other thoughts, Christine? 
and quite heavily visited too. Yeah, it would have been nice if we had some sort of, like Jessica was saying, um, of the number of individuals that visited each of the sites to help us kind of figure out why that is. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what uh, Fred had mentioned about Smoky Mountain National Park. Like it's super easily accessed. It's right next to Gatlinburg, Tennessee and Dolly, whatever the park with Dolly Parton is called. Um, it's right next to the Blue Ridge with quick access up to Shenandoah National Park. So it's a very commonly accessed park. Um, most people though, and most people attend most parks in general, sort of just drive around, do short little day hikes, things like that. But then you get the people who are doing the backpacking and falling off and doing all sorts of stuff. Um, I recently visited Grand Canyon National Park um, for the second or third time, the South Rim. And I was just talking to some of the staff of a hotel. They're like, yeah, I was just sitting out having lunch, lunch one day and this, this kid just fell off the edge. <laughs> So I mean, <laughs> things just happen all the time. And to them, I don't want to say it's normal, but they're just like, yeah, yeah, another one fell. Um, and you can quick access to cases. I just follow a lot of these parks on Facebook and they're constantly posting successful and unsuccessful SAR ops. And it's just kind of cool to see what's going on. It's usually falls <laughs> if you're talking about Grand Canyon or there was just, I think there were just two deaths from heat stroke. I think it was like a gram, grandma and great aunt had heat stroke, successfully extricated, and grandson who was six died. I think that was pretty recent. Um, any specific aspects regarding uh, Grand Teton, Dr. Smith? Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of variables, um, like like the article kind of doesn't have some of the granularity of figuring out exactly what's happening. And I think it's multifactorial. It's kind of the, the number of visitors. It's a technical area. It's uh, uh, kind of how you can interface with some of the preventative search and rescue, putting people at trailheads and say, hey, where is your avalanche gear? Where is your food and water? What's your actual plan? Maybe this is a better hike for you if you don't have that level of expertise. And so I think, yeah, there's there's lots of variabilities. And just like we know from kind of anything, and you start doing statistics, you start lumping and splitting and kind of moving things in different categories. Um, and there's not a whole lot of placebo-controlled <laughs> studies that kind of say, if you go out on this day and do that, but you try and get some correlation and things out there. But uh, yeah, no, great article. And obviously, I'd rather prevent a injury or illness rather than require a SAR rescue or uh, repetitive there but um i have noticed in my national park attendance over the years that the prevention seems to have gotten better like i'll see that there's more signs there's better descriptions of what to do there's actual description of difference between heat stroke and heat exhaustion finally it was wrong forever at grand canyon specifically um but the case i was just mentioning about heat stroke there were two separate park rangers who told this family to stop and go back. You're not prepared. You don't have the right amount of water. You don't have the appropriate gear. Um, what have you seen as far as like education and prevention that can be done and what power does a ranger have to actually undergo that? Yeah, it's still America. So it's, you have the right to die. <laughs> I mean, if you make poor decisions, I mean, if it's starting to infringe on somebody else's right or somebody else's life in danger, then sometimes they can kind of like write warnings and tickets and things like that. But generally, <clears throat> I mean, and again, you see a lot of these cases like with the suicide and the fatalities with that. There's for some reason, some people just want to go back to nature. And for some reason, the National Park Service seems to have the, the perfect definition of nature. So unfortunately, we definitely see a lot of uh, fatalities from suicides and in these and definitely as we know like the psychological first aid and kind of the the risk on to the rescuers for the mental health issues so yeah i think we're we're learning a lot of things from the preventative search and rescue to the mental health and kind of wellness of the rescuers as well as kind of family members victims families and so i think that is uh, definitely with laura mcgladry and kind of some of the other kind of leaders in that field has really made a big impact as well And one thing that I know uh, a lot of my co-fellowship faculty are becoming, I like to call it ham radio obsessed, 
But this uh, next article we're going to discuss uh, focuses on drones, which are also being more used in SAR operations. Interesting in, uh, I don't believe they're allowed in most, if any, national parks. And then it gets interesting in like uh, national forests and things like that. But ham radios can be used with drones as well. I'll mention that because I don't want to do like three articles. That's, that's too much. Um, but Sashin is... Um, shadowing us here in Roanoke, Virginia. He has worked in Nepal and, tra and trained in Nepal and is here joining us and he's going to present our next article. So take it away when you are ready. You should be able to share your screen. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a nice, uh, like, nice talk, so Jessica and Dr. Smith. Uh, yeah, I never, I didn't know much about uh, the U.S. national parks and how things go there, but yeah, it's a good, good perspective. Yeah, and <clears throat> yeah, I've, uh, yeah, I'm, I've trained in uh, Nepal and I've worked for the Himalayan Rescue Association for probably for six months in different parts of the mountains in Nepal. And, and I was the volunteer doctor in the recent uh, Everest ER season. In Nepal, I was there with uh, Andrew Nyberg and under the supervision of Dr. Luan Freer, which probably uh, wilderness uh, fellows recognize. So yeah, this topic uh, was given to me by Dr. Gardner. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, this uh, is essentially, and I don't know how, just to give me a minute. Uh, okay, fine. Fine, okay. So, this is, uh, yeah, using this, uh, uh, un using a drone essentially to conduct a complex high altitude research and rescue operation. It is a case study. Uh, it was done, uh, like uh, you said, uh, drone was uh, not permitted in. At the U.S. National Park, uh, so it is not in the usual Nepalese par national parks as well. You need special permissions. So it was done in uh, a K2 to rescue a climber uh, was uh, stuck in uh, while descending from the Broad Peak. Uh, so it is written by Jake in McRae. Uh, is it? I guess is a DO now, and it was published in the Wilderness and Environmental Medicine uh, in 2019. So uh, I'll discuss the case first. Uh, a 65 years Scottish mountaineer, uh, after summiting the Broad Peak in Pakistan, uh, it's part of the Himalaya, it's uh, just near K2. Uh, he was descending from the waste phase, that is the usual route. And uh, so, uh, like, uh, so I'll just uh, come, to, uh, I'll show you the picture in a while. So while going from the camp summit to camp three, you have to go through a steep part, uh, which you, uh, which uh, some call it the camp four as well. So you have to go through this route and this route. So while going through this route, he suddenly fell off the cliff and he lost his gears and got stuck at a particular steep point. So be like be after that point, uh, there was a direct cliff where you would have fallen down. So uh, so what uh, the group of climbers that he was uh, with. Uh, they the uh, rest of them they descended down to camp free and they waited for some time and they thought that maybe he has fallen off as uh, he's died so uh, they kind of lost hopes on him and he they communicated to the uh, team on the k2 base camp and uh, so but uh, fortunately uh, up, uh, like someone in the k k2 base camp they had a drone dji uh, and they sent uh, the drone uh, in search of that uh, of the person. So, uh, and the drone was uh, usually limited to maximum five thousand meters. Uh, okay, yes, sorry for uh, like uh, not converting to feet, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, up to five thousand meters, and uh, the so the drone actually went above the five thousand meters, even up to the altitude of eight thousand four hundred meters, which was beyond its uh, like specifications. And uh, so at uh, six, 7,600 meters, 
near the death zone, the, the death zone is usually uh, this classified from 7,500 meters to 8,000 meters. Like uh, it is the um, point beyond which uh, you can, you the body fails to acclimatize at any cost. You need supplemental oxygen. So the, he hung around that uh, region for 36 hours without water. So yeah, that was a tremendous feat on its own. And uh, uh, after that, and it uh, the drone flew beyond like in a hostile environment. Uh, it was, uh, the wind was high and the temperature was cold. That would uh, that probably affects uh, affected the battery. Uh, but fortunately, the drone could uh, locate uh, the climber, and uh, the climber got uh, like uh, further assistance and rescue. So I'll get back to the picture. So here you can see that uh, this is the K2 base camp from where the drone flew. And uh, here you can see this uh, summit uh, of the broad peak. Uh, so just uh, below the summit of the broad peak, there is camp three, uh, sorry, camp four. And uh, between camp four and camp three is where the person got stuck. There is another view for that. So yeah, so this is the, uh, this is the drone that was used. And between the summit and camp three, you can see a, a steep part. That is where the climber was stuck uh, and actually got derailed from the, like the, of the usual route. So, and, and uh, since uh, yeah, they are very near, so the rescue was possible due to the reason. So this, uh, this is a good image that I found of to visualize the, uh, camp and where the climber, you can see that it was um, probably some European language there. And I just got it from the Google. And so most probably uh, there's a, the location uh, at 7,600 meters, that is where the climber fell off and uh, yeah, got stuck. So here in the image below, you can see two people like a zoom, it's a zoom down image. This is uh, the image taken by the same drone for the, during the same rescue. Uh, and uh, here you can see two people there. They are probably around camp tree. They are the rest, uh, the rest of the climber. They are waving at the drone that they, are, they have seen. And in the image, top left image, if you just uh, focus on the small portion actually towards the right, there's a small dot. And if you zoom in, uh, then there is that, uh, uh, Climber was hanging and then crawling, which looks like an ice axe. And uh, so this is the cliff uh, that was taken by the same drone, uh, like by following the path. So this was the cliff which uh, the climber could have fallen if not for the, uh, like it could not stuck into the ice axe. So yeah, after the, after the drone found out the climber, the rest of the climbers, uh, like the drone uh, located its GPS, uh, used a GPS tracking system and located the exact position of the climber, which uh, was used by the rest of the other team to track him down and rescue him. Uh, but there are like uh, two conflicts in that. I, there, was, there are two articles that have published the same events, uh, which I found out incidentally. Uh, there was another article uh, called Mountain Rescue Operations facilitated with drone uses, uh, which was published by Porsche, Porsche Adlo uh, in Journal of Higher Education Medicine and Biology uh, in 2019 itself, but it was uh, published a few months earlier. It described the same event, uh, but uh, in a bit different manner. It more focused more on the drone uh, rather than the event. Uh, but however, it uh, stated that uh, the drone guided the climber uh, towards camp three, towards a path to the uh, proper path uh to the camp tree so to clear out the confusion i contacted with the writer uh through email and the writer replied that uh, uh the utility of the drone was over after the drone located the climber and after that uh, the team uh, helped him to come back to return to camp tree by night so the he was not he he actually had faded memory of the events but he uh, he gave me a quoted in the uh, like quoted uh, statement from the climber himself uh, that he had taken during the interview, which I don't have it right now. So I have it in my email, but this is the 
like summary of what the climber meant that it is not the drone that he facilitated him. The drone just localized him and the rest of the climbers went up there and kind of pulled pull him off. And before the climbers actually helped him back, so he was kind of stuck in a st uh, slope. So the drone kind of, upon seeing the drone, he, he got an encouragement to climb up. And then now he got a hope that uh, the other climbers will find me up. So he kind of climbed up again. The drone went back and again came back to see the climber. And uh, upon seeing the drone again, so you're sure that he's, he's getting rescued. So that gave him more encouragement to go up and uh, get to a, a better path so that other people, other climbers could come there. And that helps. So it was more of an encouragement and locating device uh, uh, in the path for, for him. So yeah, the drone, I have written it, the drone, I will tell about the limitations and the other article, the HAMB article uh, also mentioned that uh, the software uh, like was upgraded uh, that removed its uh, limitations of maximum ceiling and vertical speed. Like the, it had the maximum ceiling of 5,000 meters, but since the software was upgraded, it, the ceiling got removed and uh, uh, it could um, go higher than it was uh, specified in its original uh, like uh, instructions. Uh, so that was not in this article. Though. So I have combined two different articles uh, so, uh, and of information. So yeah, and uh, the, in the same uh, HAMB article, it was mentioned that the same drone was again used to deliver medications with a uh, climber that was suffering from backache, a back sprain uh, so, uh, at camp three of K2, that is 6,900 6, meters. So it was used again uh, for not the same purpose, but similar purpose again for in the high altitude. So yeah, the overall to see how this unmanned aircraft system rescue or drones help is that they, they're, like especially the smaller ones, they are very, they're light, they can uh, go through different terrains, they can uh, like squeeze through uh, the narrow canyons and they can use the infrared sensing to locate where the person is, even if the imaging is uh, not that clear. And they can use the GPS to track the exact location and uh, they can use thermal camera and with the advances of machine learning and artificial intelligence, so um, these days uh, the drones have become are getting much more advanced. They can uh, recognize small uh, details and can separate small like have a contrast of small details from the rest of the background, even from a great height itself. And that will that uh, helps uh, a lot by minimizing the risk for rescues. So imagine how anybody else could have like found him after going to the rescue. That is not possible. And you can go cover vast area at a small time. You can scan all more plenty or plenty of area. So yeah, I think this is the few drones are the future for like search and rescue. So they are they it will become a mainstream thing uh, in the coming future. I don't think so. It will be of very far years. So it will in the next five to ten years, uh, drones will be completely mainstream in any search and rescue team. So the, there are uh, like disadvantages though that usually is the battery life is still a concern. So if, uh, till now there are like uh, some drones are like, are programmed for the long duration of flight, uh, but they have this uh, battery issues. And especially when uh, while up it's cold and it can get windy. So to navigate through the strong winds, they need more horsepower and that can, uh, limit the battery life and wind and temperature can uh, affect it. And another issue is with uh, collisions. Uh, so what is uh, important, what is important, usually in the drone flight, uh, when a drone flies, uh, the operator is uh, usually within the uh, direct sight, like a direct view with, of the drone. So, but uh, when it's come to search and rescue, the drone has to evade the line of sight. Uh, because uh, it can, it can, it has, might have to go to some narrow crevices somewhere else. So in such conditions, uh, you never know uh, what can hit you from the side. So uh, there can be unexpected collisions from anywhere. So there have been uh, designs that are developing uh, to protect, uh, like uh, like a shield type or that materials that take the like that change uh, shape that. Uh, kind of absorb the impact. So such kind of developments are happening right now. So there was a 
like an article published by the state uh, Arizona University, state university uh, somewhere in the USA that have uh, recently published an article where they have devised some collision uh, like protection to, to drones. And uh, so there are multiple opportunities. So there are areas where drone, uh, like these are the areas where uh, the drone research is going on and it can like help uh, in many different settings. Uh, like, uh, so suppose uh, uh, you need a multiple views for, for of a particular place. So usually a single drone uh, might not cover all everything. So these days, what is uh, what they call is multimodal interaction, uh, where multiple drones are uh, are launched at the same time, and they take multiple uh, images from multiple angles, and all the images are processed at the same time, so that a single operator can actually control multiple drones at the same time and get a composite image. That is with the help of machine learning, it will get much uh, better and better. And uh, there are the drones have been mobilized for avalanche rescues. So yeah, aval in avalanche, uh, so it's difficult. If we have a limited uh, time to rescue and uh, to keep a CPR because like if the more the delay, the, the greater the chance that patient, the patient will suffocate or go into cardiac arrest. So uh, like with the drone, uh, with thermal imaging or uh, similar technologies, you can identify with the uh, uh, affected victims are affected, uh, like located, and uh, you can mobilize the rescue team uh, uh, precisely, and that will be much faster, and many people can be saved. So there is uh, something called danger, like drones aided network for guided uh, guiding emergency and rescue operations. So here, what happens is, suppose in a in a wilderness environment, not just mountains. Uh, so there are uh, multiple drones that uh, go there. And you, the person will communicate uh, with the drone with a Wi-Fi, and the drone will relay that signal to the uh, operator. So in that way, you can communicate uh, in the wilderness, uh, to, like to the operator, without any. Uh, so the network communications can get destroyed uh, in many natural disaster times. So in that, that will facilitate the communication with the, directly with the operator. So that is one thing that is going on, and. Um, there is something called acoustic wave communication as well, where uh, the signals are amplified with the help of drone communication signals. And there is another a nice article about the defibrillator drones. I read about it. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was actually a randomized control trial uh, where uh, in the mountain region, uh, there was, uh, they used a defibrillator drone, drone where uh, from a station, uh, the uh, drone carried the AED to the particular location where the victim was placed. And there, the waiver was there to, uh, in contact, he used that AED to uh, help the patient during a cardiac arrest. So that uh, improved, kind of uh, like saved uh, plenty of life. That was a good article to read. And uh, there are uh, some uh, now like uh, beyond there are other system uh, like a drone receptor repeater system configuration. Uh, yeah, like I've said, similar communicate similar thing to, uh, related to acoustic wave communication, where uh, they kind of amplify and maintain radio communication uh, through by acting as a port like temporary aerial towers. So it is a very good technology, and uh, there is on something called BVLOs. As a beyond visual line of sight drone operation, there are like new technologies that are trying to tackle the limitation that I had described before, where uh, the drone will find it difficult to operate beyond the line of sight. Uh, and um, so, in in as a whole, this uh, U.S. Uh, what I've also found was that U.S. Department of Homeland Security it has a special task force that uh, like rates and kind of compares the uh, drones uh, that can be used for search and rescue operations. So you can directly, you can Google it, uh, the, uh, the US uh, Homeland Department of Homeland Security and uh, their drone uh, rating and drone, uh, uh, how they like classify drone uh, uh, depend, depending upon how good they are uh, in, during a surveillance at a particular situation. So uh, they have, very large summary of different kind of drones that are 
commercially available. So that's you can, if you're interested, you can check that out. I don't have any references linked right now because there are plenty. So I would like to end my session here. Thank you very much for listening and please feel free to ask any questions that I could know. Uh, and uh, if Dr. Smith is there and if he wants to share his experience about drones, then like it will be a good uh, learning for us. And as far as my experience in mountains are concerned, I, where I worked in the Everest uh, Base Camp, uh, the drones uh, are technically illegal unless you have to, you have to get clearance from multiple authorities. So there is a quite large bureaucracy involved between getting a drone approval. So that is a hindrance uh, for like a drone to get involved in such a rescue, which I wish gets better over the time. I wish like some similar kind of uh, rescue operation that happened in the uh, Broad Peak and K2 region happens in that Himal in the Everest region as well. And uh, it has a potential, uh, let's see. So until now it's all about, I've seen that person uh, somewhere kind of thing or the person's trying to uh, give the GPS signal. So the search and rescue uh, situation in uh, the Nepalese mountain area is not that good. So once you're lost, it's difficult to find you. Uh, so by saying that, uh, I would like to end my presentation here. Thank you. Well, great job. Thank you very much. And he mentioned a um, separate article that I had in the uh, participation folder for who any, anybody interested in using drones for communication purposes. But uh, he just mentioned essentially all the communication capabilities of drones, which are they can be used as repeaters for Wi-Fi, for more traditional contact for services, or as a repeater for the significant geographic limitations of a ham radio. Um, but I, I'm also interested to see with further research with better battery life um, and like bad weather capabilities, drone use and you know, National Park Service and State Park Services allowing drones to be used. Um, we'll see, I'm sure, significant increased use. Um, I'm sure part of the reason they don't want to allow them for now is I'm sure you're aware people won't understand that drones are being used for rescue. They'll just see a drone and be like, well, how come they get to use it and I can't? And then they'll just start using them saying, well, I saw this person do it. So I'm sure that's part of it also because national parks are to protect land, protect limited resources, uh, endangered species and things like that, and for our own use. Uh, but it's it's going to be interesting to see in the next five, 10 years, what we see with drones. Any other uh, questions on the article or experiences with drones? Uh, this is Fred again. Yeah, I've, I've actually, um, I've had my FAA drone license. I have a pilot, pilot pilot's license as well, but I've had my FAA license for drones for a few years now too. And, and uh, I have the same DJI Maverick Pro that they used in that article. It was really interesting. I can tell you that uh, once you get to about two miles away, uh, the pilot will start getting tachycardia and uh, heart palpitations because uh, I <laughs> would be freaking out if that plus the cold and and the, the battery is like on a it's like 27 minutes on a perfect you know perfect perfect day normal temp and I, I know that was mentioned but I, I think that's a big part of that is that I don't really know how much you would you would get plus you add some of the wind into it I mean I've taken it to a lot of different places but to the beach or whatever and if it's a windy day I mean forget it you 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 really can can control it now with the bigger drones different story and they can kind of deal with uh, a little bit more and then potentially get a little more extension of battery life and all that at, at uh you know from that angle so i i i think it's i thought it was super interesting to look at that because i i've done so much I, you know i I'm, i suck at the cinematography part i'm good at flying so in case anybody ever is a passenger in my plane i promise i don't i'm not i don't suck at that but the camera you know, I'm not making it, but I can tell you that that this makes so much sense, especially with the repeaters for the radios. That makes sense. All, all this, I think, would be a huge tool uh, for search and rescue, assuming you're using the right stuff. I just think it's really funny that they were able to use that 
small, it's a small drone. I mean, it's tiny that the, 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 you know, compared to some of the other, these other, the other ones. And the other nuance I was going to say is that currently they've been talking about, the FAA has been talking about doing different things in the U.S. The FAA requires you to be able to see the drone. So what you do, even though you can go much farther away from where you actually can see it, it's like turns into a little speck and, you know, like a thousand feet. I mean, you know, it, it goes away pretty quick. So what the FAA requires is you have a line of sight. So you end up having to get spotters to kind of, you know, take that further. So you have to get like five or six people in a long line. And it almost, uh, to some extent, maybe de defeats the purpose of the drone. But uh, fa but fascinating case, case report, and I, and I agree with what you just said. I, I think this is, has huge capabilities to, you know, under the right circumstances. Yes, the article mentioned that, uh, the also mentioned the same thing. Uh, it's a usual battery time is 27 minutes in ideal condition. And they estimated that based upon the conditions there, it was 18 minutes of time, but somehow they managed it. <laughs> And to even uh, to get the drone back safely so that it could be used later. So yeah, very good pilot. Uh, and kind of circling back to search and rescue as more of a broad topic, I think it'll be very interesting to see closer to the Roanoke area. Uh, we have one of the newest, youngest national parks in the New River Gorge. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how search and rescue, how um, attendance, and just the overall number of accidents and visit uh, visitors change from the prior management to now actually being a national park. I think anybody interested in uh, research would probably easily find a project there if anybody's interested. Um, any other questions about search and rescue or... Uh, Sorry, it's like a circus in my house. We have tons of animals and now a kid. So there's a lot of stuff in the background. Any questions otherwise? I put some resources in the chat above. Hopefully you can find those. All right, well, that being said, I'm going to end um, recording. And anybody wanted to talk about any other wilderness medicine or uh, WMS stuff, we can stick around. <laughs>